Let's talk about the activation functions. Just remember that what a simple neuron does. It takes the input, then calculates the weighted sum, adds the bias, and finally, it has to decide whether it should be fired or not. In other terms, it should be activated or not. That's why we call this function the activation function. Here, how we can present it mathematically. So here in this equation, the value of y can be anything ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. The neuron doesn't really know the boundaries of the value. Then how do we decide whether the neuron should fire or not? That's the reason we added an activation function to check the y value produced by a neuron and decide whether outside connections should consider this neuron as fired or not. So let's explore different activation functions available. The first thing that comes to our minds is how about a threshold-based activation function. If the value of y is above a certain threshold, declare it activated. If it is less than that, then say it's not. This could work. What do you say? Here's a step function looks like. Its output is 1, which means activated when value is greater than 0. Otherwise, it outputs 0, which means not activated. Hmm. It looks like a great solution, which can define the boundaries for y value. But hold on. There are some problems with it. Just think that. If we are creating a binary classifier, something which should say a yes or no, a step function could do that. That's exactly what it does. Say a 1 or 0. Now, think about the use case if we want multiple such neurons to be connected to bring in more classes, like class 1, class 2, class 3, etc. What will happen if more than one neuron is activated? All neurons will output a 1 if we're using the step function. Now, how do we decide which class is it? Hmm, it becomes a bit complicated. We want the network to activate only one neuron and others should be zero. Just think about what if the activation was not binary and it instead would say 50% activated for class one, class two activated 20% and class three activated 30%. So in this case, if more than one neuron activates, we could find which neuron has the highest activation and so on. Seems like we solved the problem. But hold on. Just think that, what if more than one neuron says 100% activated? Hmm, the problem still persists. Actually, we want something to give us intermediate activation values rather than saying activated or not. If you're thinking about a linear function, you are right it can help us. Just consider the equation of the straight line, like this one. So here, the activation is proportional to the weight's input. Now, it's not the binary activation, because in this way, it gives a range of activations. That's what we are looking for. The problem seems to be solved. But wait, there is another problem that comes in. Did you notice? If you're familiar with the gradient descent and how it works to train a neural network, you must be acquainted that the derivative for this function will be constant. But what's the problem? Here in this equation, the derivative with respect to x is m. That means the gradient has no relationship with inputs. So it means if there is an error in the prediction, the changes made by backpropagation are constant. And it's even not depending on the change in the input, which is delta x. That's a serious problem. But there is another thing we have to think about. If you're familiar how we stack layers on each other, you can understand that with this linear function, no matter how many layers we have, the final activation function of the last layer is nothing but just a linear function of the input of the first layer. In simple words, we just lost the ability of stacking layers this way. So at this place, the sigmoid function comes into the game. You can see that the first thing first, it is non-linear in nature. So the combinations too. It means now we can stack layers. We solved that problem. If you notice that, it will give an analog activation 
unlike step function. It has a smooth gradient too. Sigmoid functions are one of the most widely used activation functions today. Then what are the problems with this? There is the vanishing gradient problem. If you notice, towards both ends of the sigmoid function, the y values tend to respond very less to changes in x. What does that mean? The gradient at that region is going to be small or has vanished, which means the network refuses to learn further or is drastically slow. We call this gradient problem the vanishing gradient. But still, it's very popular in classification problems. So here, the 10H function that comes into the place, which might rescue us a bit from the vanishing gradient. This looks very similar to sigmoid. In fact, it is a scaled sigmoid function. The point is that the gradient is stronger for 10H than sigmoid. Great. Another function I want to discuss here is the redo activation function, short for rectified linear unit. It gives an output x if x is positive and zero otherwise. At first look, it might look like having the same problems of the linear function, but it is non-linear in nature and the range of free low is from zero to infinity, which means it can blow up the actuations. But the important thing to understand here is the sparsity of the activation. Imagine a big neural network with a lot of neurons. Using a sigmoid or 10 edge will cause almost all neurons to fire an analog way. That means the activation is dense. This is costly. We would ideally want a few neurons in the network to not activate, and thereby making the activations sparse and efficient. So here's the negative side effects will be beneficial. This means fewer neurons are firing, which means sparse actuation, and then the network is lighter. ReLU is a great activation function, but nothing is perfect, not even ReLU. Because of the horizontal line in ReLU for negative values of x, the gradient can go towards zero, because of which the weights will not get accommodated during descent. That means those neurons which go into the state will stop responding to variations in error or input. We call these neurons or dead neurons, and this problem is called the dying ReLU problem. This problem can cause several neurons to just die and not respond, making a significant part of the network passive. There are variations in, like leak ReLU to mitigate this issue by simply making the horizontal line into the non-horizontal component. ReLU is less computationally expensive than 10H and sigmoid because it involves simpler mathematical operations. The last activation function I want to discuss is the swish activation function. If you can notice, it is one of the first compound functions proposed by the combination of the sigmoid function and the input function. The smoothness property makes it produce better optimization and generalization results when used in training deep learning architectures. This function doesn't suffer from vanishing gradient problems. As the conclusion, keep in mind that the activation functions are a key part of neural network design. The modern default activation function for hidden layers is the ReLU activation. And the activation function for output layers depends on the type of prediction problem.